Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Patricia Rodriguez. I am the events manager here at Flatiron School. I'm happy to have you all join us this evening, afternoon, wherever you're joining us from, uh, for our four-part series, Becoming Tech, uh, which dives into the crucial aspects of the tech journey and addresses common challenges faced during career transition. Um, this evening, our advising team will be addressing imposter syndrome, uh, which is so common and so very normal to experience. Um, so before I pass it along, just a quick reminder that the chat feature is available, as well as the Q&A. Um, if you resonate with anything that's being shared, want to show encouragement or have any questions for our presenters, don't be shy and drop them there. Um, if you are using the chat feature, as I mentioned in the beginning, just make sure that you are sending the message to everyone instead of the default option, which is to host and panelist. Um, this event will be recorded and will be shared with attendees via email um, in the upcoming days. If this is not the case for you, you can always check out our YouTube channel where most of our public events are uploaded. So, all right, without further ado, I will let you take it away. Thank you, Patricia. I mean, you did most of my opening. I, I feel like I need to cut a whole slide out, but uh, thank you. And as Patricia said, welcome to our webinar series for Flatiron School. We will be touching base today on um, part four of our Becoming series, which is Feeling Tech, where we will be talking about imposter syndrome. I do have a wonderful panel that will be um, you know, sharing their stories, their experiences, and answering some questions a little later, but as we get started, I'm just gonna kind of give you guys um, the agenda, give you a breakdown of what to expect, and then just go from there. Okay, so briefly, really, really quickly, here's what our agenda looks like. We're gonna do a slight, very quick uh, overview of what the Becoming series is, how we got here, we're gonna deep dive, I guess not deep dive, but we're going to dive into imposter syndrome. I'm going to try to keep it short just because I know our panels have great stories of, you know, how imposter syndrome has impacted them personally, uh, whether it's a personal life or their career. So just kind of want to give you guys an overview of imposter syndrome, what it looks like, the types, how you may combat it, strategies to overcome it, ways to build confidence. And then of course, we're going to get to the more interesting part right before we wrap it up. Okay, so moving right along, as Patricia mentioned, um, or as you guys can probably see, you will not see the audio, you won't see your video. So if you do have questions, you wanna contribute to the conversation, please feel free to use the Q&A. We are gonna drop a link, like a CSAT link um, in the chat. So again, feel free to pop in the discussion, ask questions, um, give us feedback on what you like about the presentation, what you feel like we may be able to do better. We welcome all opinions and thank you in advance. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. My name is Tarina Nixon. I will be presenting part four of our series. My background is in higher education, exercise science and organizational leadership and development. I've been in academia, whether it's traditional higher ed or now in the ed tech space for the greater part of 15 years. I'm an avid athlete and fitness background. Um, so at the end of the day, I, I think the trend in my life is everything seems to be about setting goals and smashing them. So as a first generation graduate, um, I've always just loved helping students figure out those barriers, setting those goals, and then uh, getting those accomplished. I'm born and raised for the, for most of my life in Pittsburgh, PA. So I am a PA girl. I currently live in Phoenix, Arizona with my partner where the heat is literally melting every ounce of our bodies. Um, I'm one of the many awesome advisors here with our student advising team. So um, those of you who know who your advisors are, there's some bonus points. If you don't let us know, I'll let you know who they are. But I primarily work with software engineering students, cyber secure, software engineering students, cybersecurity students, and product design students, both live and flex. So um, if you're data science and you're joining, welcome. If you're part of the group that I mentioned, welcome too. Before we jump into imposter syndrome, um, kind of want to, as you can see on the, the slide, I kind of want to give an overview, a brief overview of what the tech series is. So with the advising team, some of the trends that we noticed with our students were 
they didn't, because many of them were career changers, they didn't know what it meant to become a tech professional. So what we did was we gathered some feedback and we we came up with the Becoming series, which is a four part series. Uh, part one, we did Thinking Tech. So we worked heavily with students on growth and fixed mindsets. A lot of that dealt with um, teaching students how to overcome barriers in the fixed mindset to be able to progress through tech because it's not an easy field. And I think uh, K through 12 and traditional higher ed doesn't really set us up for that. Part two, we did talking tech, which was networking, teaching you how to externalize being a tech professional, getting feedback, giving feedback, um, and then you know just working on what it looks like to have a professional network, which again, most of us don't have um, as extensive as most you know seasoned tech professionals do have. And then part four being today, which is the feeling tech, where we're going to talk about imposter syndrome. Here's some pretty great stories. Again, I'll give you guys an overview, but um, the main event, we'll save it for the end. If you weren't able to catch any of these in real time, like Patricia said, we do have, um, if you go to our YouTube channel, just YouTube Flatiron School, you can still catch them. I think if you can watch all four of them together, it'll help kind of fill in the gaps if you're um, having any kind of issues with any of the four parts of the struggles that students told us that they have. Okay, so let's jump right in. What is imposter syndrome? We tried to make it kind of short and sweet, but overall, if you've ever had kind of like the thought process of, you know, I'm a fake, I don't deserve to be here, you know, maybe they're gonna find out that I don't really know, or I'm not really a tech professional. Um, if you had that thought, if you've ever verbalized it, that might be a sign that, you know, you're you're kind of flirting with imposter syndrome to a degree. Essentially, what it is, is experiencing repeated feelings and thoughts that you're incompetent or you're just not good enough, despite contra like evidence of the contrary. So you may have been successful, but you still have these thoughts that creep in. You have the evidence that you've done great, but for some reason, there's something usually deeply embedded, kind of intrinsic, that makes you feel like I'm just not good enough. Oftentimes um, with imposter syndrome, it's external. So, and we'll touch base on that a little bit later in the presentation, but it's a lot of external factors leading to you feeling that way rather than you kind of tapping into yourself and knowing what you're capable of. It's heavily fear-based. So imposter syndrome thrives on fear. That's the fear of being found out. That's the fear of not knowing enough. That's not. That's the fear of maybe I'm a fraud. Maybe I'm not as good as I think I am. If you kind of get to the root of everything with imposter syndrome, it, it kind of always leads back to there's a deep fear in what you're capable of doing, despite, again, what you may have already done. So we added this little statistic we thought was pretty insightful and interesting. Uh, the researchers or the developers of what we know as imposter syndrome found out that 70% of adults either have it, they've experienced it, but at some point in your life, you're going to feel the impacts personally of imposter syndrome. So for those of you in your cohorts, if you have 10 people in your cohort, chances are seven of you either have had it or will have had it at some point of your life. So that kind of shed some light on just how common imposter syndrome is. We also noted that it's more prevalent in women and ethnic minorities for a variety of reasons. We, we didn't want to go too deep into it, but those two seem to be the two populations that suffer from it the most. And then just from an, a high arching overview, you're typically going to um, see it with people who are extremely hard workers, so those overworked students and employees, those super high achievers that just feel like they're never happy with whatever it is that, that they produce, they're just, no matter what they're doing, it's gonna be top level. And then the perfectionists. And I think if you're not one, we all know one. <laughs> we know what it's like to be around one. Uh, but those are gonna be the groups of people that often feel like they're engaging in fraudulent behavior. Um, I do want to say that this topic is important to me personally. I definitely have fallen into that category 
and I definitely fit into all of them. Um, so just a little bit about before I say this, I was talking with Nat before we started and, you know, we were talking about how when you're dealing with imposter syndrome, there's, there's a, a need for self-reflection that a lot of people don't think about until they're faced with, am I an imposter? So in light of transparency, I'm going to share uh, a story about myself of where I've dealt with it to kind of, you know, get you guys kind of thinking about where you may have felt it. So a little bit about me. I am a former division one basketball player who is completing her doctoral degree. Often people hear, you know, you're an athlete. There's an outdated school of thought that athletes are not smart. So we're all brawn, no brain. It's outdated, but it's there nonetheless. So in going for my master's degree, um, I had a mentor. He sits me down one day and he gives me a list of five jobs that I can do as a TA. He's like, I want you to rank them. What do you want to do the most? What do you want to do the least? I'm like, I can tell you what I want to do the least. And it's teaching. So takes a list. He starts making notes. And what does he do? He says, you're going to teach. And you get like in a split second, I was like, you know what? I don't think this is for me. I would much rather pack up my bag and look. Kentucky's humid anyway. I don't want to be here. But in my mind, I was working with the school of thought as an athlete. If I'm not smart, my peers are going to, they're going to see this. And then for them, I'm going to be getting chewed out in lectures. I'm not good enough to be up here teaching my peers. So he brings the books back. He brings the books into my office. And he says, you have all summer to learn this information well enough that your peers can't sniff you out. And I'm like, I, I'm looking at him puzzled. And he was like, that's how low you think of yourself. So he kind of gets my mind going. Um, we argued, we go back and forth at the end of the day. He's like, you either leave school or you teach. Like, I'm not letting you get out of this. So long story short, um, I get through my two years teaching and then they hire me on as full-time faculty. So now I'm riding this high. I'm like, mm, I must be good. Fast forward to present day. I'm sitting in my orthopedic surgeon's um, office waiting for him to come in. It's first thing in the morning. And he always says, I'm going to address you as doctor so that you don't get in the back of your mind that you want to quit. And I'm like, don't call me that. I haven't become a doctor yet. And I really don't even know if I want to finish. So every time I go see him, he addresses me as doctor. So one morning I'm sitting in his office and there's an older woman sitting next to me and he comes in. Good morning, Dr. Nixon. <laughs> and the woman, bless her heart, I think she meant well. But she looks over at me and she says, I didn't know your kind aspires to have education that high. Good for you. And she pats me on the back. And in a split second, I, I can't tell you the last time I had felt that small. So in my mind, I'm like, here I am doing all these things. And now I've been shrunk back to size. I felt what it felt like when it was, you're an athlete, you're not that smart. So then I questioned, should I really be trying to finish this? I have this man telling me he's going to call me doctor because he thinks I might quit. I have this woman saying my people don't usually go off to get degrees. So I had this really intense um, struggle about how I wanted to persist. And then I questioned, am I smart enough to do this on my own volition? So I said all of that to basically say, even with the accomplishments, when they're there, imposter syndrome has a way, it's very unique in how it shows up in somebody's life. So whether you see it, whether you know it's there, um, we're basically going to go through maybe what it looks like and how you guys can go about recognizing it and then strategizing. Okay. okay, really quickly, signs of imposter syndrome. So in the previous slide, I mentioned being outed as a fraud. Like I said earlier, this is probably the most important one because it's the one that you can't actually see. This is the one that's intrinsic. This is the one that people struggle with on the inside that people may say, look, you have everything. Why do you feel like an imposter? But it's something that's happening inside of you. Um, this is an opportunity to be honest with yourself. As the advising team, we always tell students, talk about it. Put words to how you feel. Like our job is to help you get through this. So you're going to be entering, if you're not already, in a very rigorous boot camp use your words, tell us, let us know. Um, and then that kind of gives us some tangibles 
to work through those barriers. The second is going to be feeling unworthy of success. This is going to be uh, typically when people are experiencing imposter syndrome, they like to minimize their success. If you're not someone that does it, we always, we know someone who, you know, no matter what you tell them, oh, it's not that good. Oh, it was all right. Eh. Like they never want what they accomplished to be as good as it actually is. That's a sign typically that they're suffering. The third is dismissing positive feedback. I know a lot of people who have a hard time accepting a compliment and positive feedback. Um, it's just, when you accept positive feedback or when you dismiss it, it's almost like you are, um, you have a way of thinking that the work was not as act, it was not as good as it actually was. So then there's, you're dealing with, I have this successful product that I, that I just did, or I just completed this lab or this assignment or this assessment, but I have this internal struggle that I'm actually not that good. So again, it comes back to this um, intense internal battle. Um, fourth, distrusting of others. I think we all know that trust requires a certain level of vulnerability. When you're vulnerable, people can see you. So people tend to use distrust as a way of keep, keeping people far enough away not to be exposed. The fifth, um, again, comes back to luck. Oh, it was good luck that I kind of talked about um, a little bit earlier. And then over-preparing is one that I think not a lot of people really pay attention to. It's feeling like you have to over-prepare so that you can hide that you are a fraud. You may not actually be a fraud, but if you over-prepare, then nobody can sniff you out. All right, moving through it. So five types of imposter syndrome. We see it a lot in tech. I'm sure uh, we can probably see it in every other area of our life. I'm just going to kind of read these verbatim. So we have the perfectionist. This is the person wanting everything to be perfect. They will sacrifice their time, their happiness, their family, their mental health, <laughs> eating, working out. Like they will literally sacrifice everything to make sure that it's perfect. Generally, they're going to be setting really high standards. And then when they don't achieve them, they feel like a fraud. So they are going to set an almost unrealistically high standards. And then when they don't achieve them, despite how good they ultimately produce, they're still going to feel like a fraud. Then you have the natural genius. This is going to be like your valedictorian. These are the people that are always top of their class in high school. They were probably a part of every club at school and won every competition. You get them in a room with people that are equally as smart and then they they cave and feel like they're not as smart as they thought they were because they now have been introduced to people who are just as smart as they are. You have the rugged individualists. They're used to solving problems alone. They work in silos. They, If they have to ask for help, they're like, if I'm asking for help, then I'm really just not that good. So that it's another internal gut check that if you have to ask for help, you're probably a fraud because you're not that good. You have the expert. Uh, they're used to being the most knowledgeable on a given topic. So when they aren't, that's when they struggle. They question everything they know. Am I really as smart as I think that I am? Um, simply because, and it's hard for anyone to know everything, but the expert is going to try. And then they're going to be really hard on themselves when they find that they're not. And then lastly is the superhero. They, these are the people that are going to outwork those around them to prove their worth and that they belong. So these are kind of like the five general types of imposter syndrome. Um, if you're comfortable, I would invite you to drop in the chat with what you identify with. I probably flirt between the rugged individualist and the superhero, but it, I always say it's probably childhood trauma. It's just made its way into my adult life. Um, but yeah, if you're comfortable dropping in where you identify, it's not black and white either. You could go back and forth between all of them. You could identify as all of them. They could appear in different points in your life. They could be based on what scenarios or situations that you're in. So yeah. Okay, so when do you feel like an imposter? So there are a lot of times that you can feel like an imposter. The two greatest contributors are, they're going to be your culture and your environment. So culture could be how you were brought up. Culture could be 
you know, what you identify as it, it, environment could be work. Um, it could be home. We gave a few examples. So at home being unprepared for responsibilities like parenting, marriage, caring for elder, elderly relatives, and just being fearful that you're not making the right decisions. Uh, my mom's always said, you know, kids don't come with how to manuals, like we're all learning on the fly, but then you get on social media and you see the perfect parent and then you feel like you're a fraud of a parent. So there are a lot of things that, you know, from an at home or personal perspective that may play a role in that. At school, the fear of looking clueless and not knowing enough. Again, we've all been in that environment where maybe you had a question and you didn't quite answer something, but you're afraid to answer, raise your hand. No one else is raising their hand. So it's like, am I the one who doesn't get it? Which again, triggers that feeling of, well, maybe I shouldn't be here. Maybe I don't know. And then at work, generally attributed success, it comes back to luck. Well, I happen to know somebody. That's why I got the job. I was lucky. I My boss doesn't pay attention to what I do. I was lucky. So typically at work, we tend to attribute that to luck. Um, but the main point is that imposter with imposter syndrome as adults, we tend to link it to knowledge and performance. So it's going to be one of those two things that really give you that internal gut check of, am I an imposter or do I really know what I'm talking about? Um, maybe you didn't get the raise at work. Well, did I not get the raise because I didn't deserve it? Do I, am I not good at, as good as I thought I was? Um, so yeah, those tend to be the two greatest all right, really, really quickly. This is imposter imposter syndrome in the tech industry. It's huge in tech. It's it's. We talk to a lot of students, and imposter syndrome is very, very real in tech, especially with career changers. Um, especially, we'll hear from a few who have completely jumped ship on careers, and what that's been like. But here's some things to keep in mind. Tech is constantly evolving and it, it really is a culture of continuous learning. We tell students, we're trying to give you guys a foundational, like the foundational knowledge. Tech changes so much and there's no way that you're going to know everything. There's no way that you can learn everything. We've had instructors tell us that they still are in a place where they're still learning. So if you can kind of go into this field with an open mind that you're going to can constantly you're going to find stuff. You're going to discover stuff. You're going to, you're probably going to forget stuff and then relearn it later. It's just having that mindset that it's, it's just a constant state. There's no stopping point. It's a lot like medicine. Um, the way learning happens. So I think K through 12 and in college, we've always been taught that learning is linear. Go to first grade, pass this, you get the second grade, go from here. Everything's point A to point B to point C in a straight line. Tech, not so much. It's going to be a lot of chunk learning. You're going to, you're going to know a lot and then you're going to forget a lot. And then you're going to read and you're going to have the updates. You're, it, it, again, it goes back to the continuous learning. Um, so just remember, it's not going to be in a linear fashion. So a lot of the phone calls that we take, a lot of the mentoring and coaching that we do is trying to get students out of the fixed mindset of, okay, I should know this. I have to know this. I have to know everything. Take it a piece at a time. Uh, the belief that everyone is learning more skills. We have officially entered the universal hustle culture. So everyone with all of these platforms, you're, you can learn a skill set in two days and you know receive a certificate. There's this mindset that everyone is learning something. So if you're behind, again, it's going to check your, your imposter syndrome. You're feeling like, Hey, I'm not as knowledgeable as Sally down the street, or I'm not taking the time that I need to take to learn everything that I need to learn. Doesn't really work that way. I always encourage students when you can learn as much as you can, but don't feel like you have to be bogged down by the hustle culture of just because everyone's trying to learn. Your brain can only absorb so much and you can only apply so much. Learn what you can for when you need it and just move forward as needed. And then the loneliness and isolation of tech. A lot of people think that tech is just an isolated industry outside of people in the product design. They 
my PD students do a lot of collaboration. My cyber students are like, Tarina, I want to be in a room with 75 computers and it's dark and I don't want to talk to anybody. And I just want to, I just want to white, what do you guys call it? White hat hack, ethical hacking. Like my cyber students, those are the conversations that we usually have. So there's the stigma that outside of product design students, tech is an isolating industry. We're big and we preach community here. If we can team you up with someone, I'm constantly throwing students at other students to pair up. Don't go into this thinking that tech has to be an isolating industry just because that's the way, again, outside of product design, that's how we've been trained to believe that it is. Okay, I'm gonna read these so I can move through this. How to overcome imposter, imposter syndrome, unpack it. If you take anything from that, unpack it and talk about it. Identify your triggers. I told you guys earlier, I had a woman, I knew everything that I accomplished. She said one sentence to me, it almost threw me over a cliff. Identify what they are so you recognize when they're coming. Remind yourself of your abilities and your accomplishments. Pat yourself on the back, brag a little bit. We're already hard on ourselves. Give yourself permission to be great. Build community. Again, something that we preach on here. You're going to need it. Tech is a collaborative um, field. So if you can start here in Flatiron, it'll make it a lot easier once you get to the work world. Accept positive feedback. We know that when you say but after a sentence, everything in front of it negates it. So don't say thank you, but I didn't. Thank you, but it wasn't. Just say thank you and keep it moving. That'll help you feel more comfortable and it'll make it a lot easier to be able to share your own accomplishments. Leave your comfort zone. We all, nothing, no, nothing's ever grown in, in a comfort zone. So if you get the opportunity, try to leave it as often as possible. If you fall in your face, get up and keep it moving. There's always tons, of, a ton of ways to learn. Again, going back to K through 12, we were always taught there's one answer right or wrong tech, there are counter solutions, and there are a million ways that people can arrive at the same answer. Last but not least, schedule a meeting with your advisor. This is what we're trained to do. We're trained to help. This is our, we've talked to hundreds, if not thousands of students. Our job is to help you work through this. And the more you can get used to saying it to us, it'll be a lot easier once you get out into the work world and start applying for jobs. Eh, we'll skip over this. This is just ways to build confidence, practice, externalize, find a coach, someone that can help build you up when you are feeling low. Oh, track your progress. I always tell students, you don't know where you're going until you know where you've been. It'll be a lot easier to say what your accomplishments are if you can look back and see how far that you've come to get there. Whew, all right. Without further ado, now that I've laid the foundation, gosh, I talked a little longer than I wanted to, um, but we are going to now work with our panelists. I have two Flatiron grads, Nat, aka Nathaniel. He was a one of my cybersecurity students, and then we have Anthony. He was one of my software engineering students, and then Miss Maribel. She will be joining us from R and R Partners. Super excited to hear their stories. I put the questions up. I wanted the panel to be able to share their stories, weave the questions kind of into their stories. Feel free to answer them, make sure we're um, hitting on some of the main points. But overall, I my goal with this was for you all to see how imposter syndrome has shown up in people's lives. So without further ado, Nat, I'll let you take the floor. Life works. We're good. Yeah. We're good, okay. So uh, my name is Nat, like Tarina said, um, I graduated the CS Flex program in February. Um, formerly, I was a registered critical care nurse for eight years. Um, so in the chat, uh, I said that one of the things that I struggle with is being an expert in the field and then going somewhere else and not feeling like that. Um, <clears throat> so I was a critical care nurse doing the open heart, doing open heart sur uh, surgeries, and I would recover the patients. And I got to the point in my career where everyone would come to ask me questions. And 
my imposter syndrome was not there when that was uh when that was the case well recently i jumped into a tech career in cybersecurity. i started with a great company um called threat angler and i'm cyber security consultant now um so i basically that title means I do anywhere from SOC analyst to recommendations to the companies we work with. Um, and I'm starting to get my hands on doing compliance auditing and pen testing, which is what uh, Trina was mentioning about the ethical hacking. Um, so I'm starting to get my hands on some of that and um, working with a bunch of different clients from all over the world. It's really cool. So um, I changed careers for a lot of reasons. Sharina knows most of them. Um, mainly, I felt like I was stuck. I did not like the medical field culture at all anymore. And I felt like I got into nursing to help people. And because of the way the medical field is, um, it was more of the business of getting people's money. And not a fan of that, especially when we're dealing with people's lives. And I decided to go into tech. Uh, mainly because I was a gamer and had to troubleshoot my computers. And I'm really a uh, really big privacy advocate, which is why I ended up going into cybersecurity because everybody is very concerned about privacy of their data, whether it's just your credit card information, just, or like a secret proprietary blend like Mac has for their uh, operating system. And they lock it behind like 10 closed doors. So I uh, like data privacy preaching on it learning how to secure myself better, and then educating my family members, especially that are tech illiterate, for lack of better terms. Um, so that's kind of how I ended up here. Um, as far as the imposter syndrome goes with my new job, it was extremely bad until last week. Um, the way I broke through it was community. It's the best way to uh, best way to explain it. Uh, my boss is incredible, to say the least. Like, I, I truly appreciate him. He uh, spoke to me and I was telling him why I was overwhelmed, what was going on, why I felt overwhelmed, because like Tarina was talking about, you need to talk about how you're feeling or you're never ever going to overcome it by just yourself because you lock yourself in a cage. So he explained to me his thought process on how he started doing work and compared to how he does it now um basically explained to me each little step that he does to keep his anxiety down um he actually even mentioned imposter syndrome in the talk that we had because he uh he had some pretty high profile profile jobs in the past coming from um sysadmin going all the way up to being uh director at the Federal Reserve for their cybersecurity division. So, yeah. So he struggled with imposter syndrome and I talked to him about it. And after we had that conversation, I took what he told me and applied it to my work the next day and basically had a couple comments of, where did this come from? You're doing so good. Um, so that was the improvements that I started making happened last week. The first three and a half weeks of my job, I was an anxious mess the entire time. Um, I didn't hate getting up, but I was so worried about what was going to happen in a day and how I was going to react uh, because I didn't know how to do everything, which is the expert part coming back in and the perfectionist as well. Um, he also explained to me that yeah, it is. Yeah, it is a common feeling. It makes it it makes it a lot better when the guy who's in charge of your company tells you, "I felt exactly like you did when I was in your shoes." Um, he then went on to explain um, that you don't need to know everything, which is something that I struggle with because I like knowing everything. Um, he was like, you don't need to know everything. I don't expect you to ever know everything. You need to know how to find it. Know your resources, know your tools, and you will succeed in a tech career. As long as you learn your tools and know where to find things, you will, you will be su successful in whatever path you're taking, cybersecurity, software development, whatever. 
Um, so I kind of led into like how it affected me. It, but it, my, my work is just terrible when I'm struggling with it. Um, and it takes me a extremely long time to do even menial tasks. Um, and usually that leads to anxiety and the anxiety for me comes out in frustration and that affects my home life. Um, it affects my wife, it affects everybody around me. So I needed to break out of that as fast as I could. And I fortunately have a very great boss that was able to help me. Um, and then my coworkers on top of that, they're very, very young, but are very self-aware. And anytime I did something right, they would tell me, that's excellent. Keep doing that. Keep doing that. And you really need to be able to tell yourself that too. Um, experiencing imposter syndrome, I, I relate it to my anxiety as far as, as far as how I feel. So whenever I feel my anxiety going up, I'm usually, when it's been related to work, I usually feel uh, very anxious and then angry whenever I do something wrong. Um, and then tips for students working through the phases. Foundations, phase one, phase one. You learn phase one, you do, you take your time on phase one, everything else just falls in place um, as far as cybersecurity goes. But I'm assuming the rest of the programs are kind of set up like that. Your foundations are good. Working through the phases it becomes a piece of cake by the time you get to the end. So, I mean, that's, that's how it was for me. Um, and then partner up with somebody you can talk to. That will always help work with somebody, even if you're not talking to sit in a call with them. So that's what I did. That's how I finished. And yeah, so that's kind of my story. Thank you, Nat. Appreciate yep. it, buddy. All right, Anthony, I'll let you take the floor. We'll jump right in. Hey, fantastic. Um, super excited to be here. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me. Um, so much great stuff already mentioned. Fantastic. I'm learning a lot myself. Um, but like Tarina said, my name is Anthony. Uh, I am also a graduate of Flatiron uh, through the software engineering track. Um, I graduated uh, last December. So um, I've kind of had a unique journey getting into tech. Uh, I am also a career changer, shifter, however you want to um, call that. Uh, I was a industrial electrician, journeyman electrician for almost 17 years. Um, so working uh, in the trades as a, a tradesman uh, in construction for most of my adult life. Um, but I also, uh, I had a unique journey through life. Um, I struggled with addiction for a very long time. Um, and my addiction led me down some dark paths and I ended up being incarcerated. So I spent seven years of my life uh, incarcerated in the state of Arizona, where I am now. I'm in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, and uh, it was probably the best thing that happened to me, uh, being incarcerated. Um, not only did it force me to change myself and my outlook on life, but it also introduced me to tech. Um, so I was uh, part of a program while incarcerated that uh, taught inmates, uh, justice-involved individuals, web development. Um, you know, so that was where I was introduced to tech. Before that, uh, I was, like I said, a tradesman. I really had, uh, you know, no experience with the computer other than maybe uh, going online and sending some emails. Um, so it was really cool to get this uh, introduction to tech uh, in coding and in development. Uh, and I took to it like a fish to water. Um, I loved it. Um, so upon release, uh, that uh, desire to pursue this as a career uh, was strong. Uh, and that led me to other programs and other uh, resources that led me through Flatiron. Um, so I'm currently now a, a coding instructor for the, the same program that I actually went through, Persevere. Um, and so I'm able to come full circle and give it back. But um, that's just a little bit about me. Uh, in my journey, uh, and it's going to help kind of describe my thought process and my experience with imposter syndrome, um, because like uh, Tarina and like Nat explained, um, this is something that we feel fairly often. It's something I feel on a daily basis, not just for my career uh, and in tech and in uh, shifting um, jobs, but also um, with the stigmas that come with um, justice involved, ex-felon, um, uh, addict in recovery, those type of things. Uh, I feel feelings. I could just be walking through Walmart uh, or at the mall. And, um, I feel those eyes upon me, 
uh, are, can these people tell who I am? Do they know um, those feelings of uh, like Trina spoke on of a feeling of fraud or not feeling good enough? Um, you know, we call it imposter syndrome, but a lot of this can be uh, not just for our careers, but also for life. Uh, these feelings and then these coping mechanisms that we learn to deal with it and overcome it, um, you know, because we feel these things in so many different parts of our life. Um, you know, and so this really isn't just a story about me and, and my journey, but, but how do I deal with, um, you know, these experiences in life and these feelings that come up? Because very similar to Nat, um, it's an anxiety thing for me. Um, it makes me nervous. It makes me frustrated. Um, when Tarina showed the slide of which types we are, I was more of the two and three uh, kind of a know-it-all, I guess, would be a fun way to put it, but always did well in school. Um, certain things came easy to me, uh, you know, so it, it it never really was a struggle. And then very introverted. Uh, I like the, the metaphor of a silo. Uh, I have a silo around me all the time. Uh, it's my little bubble. Um, so it's very difficult for me to get out of that, um, you know, so when I have to communicate, I have to ask questions, um, you know, I have to get out of my element um, to to just find answers to these things, um, you know, I can relate to those those types. Um, so I feel that anxiety, I feel these feelings, uh, you know, that's how I can kind of tell that this imposter syndrome, um, you know, which is the label we put on it, but really could be a lot of things in life uh, when I have those feelings. Um, how has it affected me in uh, transitioning my career? Um, I would say for the most part, it's actually been a good thing and I'll get to why in a second. But um, to start, I think it, it hindered me a bit. Um, like I said, I graduated from Flatiron way back in December. So I've been out for here eight months now. Um, and I was afraid even to apply to places um, because I felt that feeling of imposter syndrome. Uh, what's my resume going to look like? Uh, am I even going to make it, you know, past their first, um, you know, cut? Uh, if I do and I actually go to an interview, are they going to ask me about my background? Am I going to have to do a background check? So many different feelings that um, really led me to the fact of not even applying. Um, but I remember a, a saying my dad used to have, it's like the lotto, you can't win if you don't play. So eventually we got to get off the bench and we got to try, um, which is one of my first coping mechanisms um, is action. You know, uh, we, we're not going to alleviate these feelings uh, just sitting and festering and sulking. We have to get out of ourselves and take that action. Um, but why I said it benefited me in my career is it's, uh, like Tarina said, it's forced me out of my comfort zone. Um, and in my experience, in my journey, the, the most growth that's happened in my life is when I was at the most uncomfortable stages of my life. That is when growth truly happens, uh, whether it's because we're forced into a corner and we have to change, or it's because we're at a spot where we know we need to change and we're willing to make that effort. Um, but, uh, imposter syndrome and this shift in career has, has forced me to become better at some of these things. Uh, for example, communication. Like I said, I'm an introvert. Uh, I don't like to ask questions. I don't like to reach out. I want to be the know-it-all that, that has the answers. Um, so it's forced me to be a better communicator um, in a role that's remote, hybrid, uh, the, the new tech landscape, um, whether it's through email, through text, uh, you know, it's really forced me to utilize all the technologies I have, Slack, all these different platforms to reach out and ask questions. Um, you know, asking a question is a form of action. Like I said, taking action um, requires you to really, um, you know, get out of that comfort zone. Um, so it's definitely affected me in my career uh, and getting in for a positive now when I look back. Um, and then finally, the things I want to touch on, I kind of touched on it a little bit, is some of my um, coping mechanisms. Uh, like I said, taking action, you know, um, I, I heard a while back that being vulnerable is actually a good quality. It's a good character trait to have. Not vulnerable in the sense that you can be taken advantage of, but being vulnerable in the sense that you're willing to fall on your face. You're willing to, to see your, have others see you in that spot, uh, pick yourself up, dust yourself off and keep going. Um, so being vulnerable, having acceptance of where you are uh, and, and uh, goals and sights in the future where you're trying to get um, communication. Uh, this is a, a great thing. Being curious, um, never stop learning, asking questions and tech. Like Tarina said, the landscape is continuously changing. So constantly asking questions um, and then being empathetic to others in their their situation, because you'll end up coming full circle and being able to give back to when others feel that imposter syndrome. Um, 
So I know I kind of rambled there a little bit. Uh, the last thing I would say is, um, you know, for, for those that are thinking about going through Flatiron or are in Flatiron now, uh, my advice is to, first of all, have fun. Um, and second of all, break stuff. Um, break things, fix it, break it again. Uh, my best form of learning was doing things repetitive. You know, there's chemistry behind it, making the connections in our brain, uh, doing things over and over and over. Have fun, ask questions, and be aggressive. Uh, not in a negative way, but uh, be accountable for yourself, um, advocate for yourself. Uh, and with that, I will pass it back. Thank you for letting me be here and speaking. Of course, of course. Thank you for that, Anthony. We really appreciate you sharing your story. And again, I told you before, when we started talking, I'm like, you got something there that I think will be really helpful. So thank you for choosing to share that with us. All right, Ms. Maribel, I will leave the end to you. Thanks, Tarina. And what a hard two uh, speakers to follow up. What incredible stories. So inspiring. Um, a little background about myself. Um, I'm Maribel. I um, have been in the industry for almost two decades now. And I um, pretty much followed what I guess would be considered a traditional path. I did an undergrad um, in design. I went to design school. I did a master's in human computer interaction. But even though I would be seen as somebody who took a traditional path, I don't think that's something that people should feel like imposter syndrome about because this field changes so frequently that even the things I learned in school, none of it <laughs> applies today. Um, and even once I graduated and went into the field, it was like drinking water from a fire hose because everything changes so fast. So as many people have said on this call, in, on this call um, you will need to um, constantly educate yourself. This is a field where you really just need to always be learning and always um, be willing to not know everything. It's fine, as we have said. Um, so, uh, I, a little bit of background of how the types of industries I've worked in, I worked in everywhere from hospitality to higher ed, and now I'm at a uh, an ad agency, so R&R Partners, if you all know the, the saying, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, um, that was a little campaign uh, started by R&R &R that has now become part of our culture. Um, so there I work um, mainly on websites, sometimes apps. Um, as far um, it, in, as imposter syndrome goes, I would say if I were a fish, it's the water I swim in. <laughs> because everything, Tarina, you mentioned that you know, leads to imposter syndrome, I pretty much check all of those boxes. I am a female minority. English is my second language. I am a daughter of Mexican immigrants. So first generation, everything American college grad. Um, so it it is something that is deeply embedded in me personally. So I have to fight it mm -hmm. um, all the time. Um, and so I would say, you know, some of the techniques or strategies to to fight it, as we've mentioned, like surround yourself with people who will be supportive and who will mentor you, because that is extremely important. Um, so even when you go off and you're interviewing for places, make sure that these are places that have a culture of support and that they uh, allow you to make mistakes, but these are all essential for growth. Um, I would also say kind of design thinking, right? Reframing is big. So reframing um, your imposter syndrome into growth, right? It means you're pushing yourself out of your comfort zone, which is what is essential for growth. Um, uh, and yeah, uh, I would say, even just some other like, you know, very pinpointed strategies. Um, I think 
uh, Tarina, you mentioned one of the strategies is to keep note of your progress. So mm -hmm. even every time you get a kudos or anything, like write it down. Um, that really helps. Like keep a note in which you just, and it's, you know, it's there from other people. So you know that you are doing well because other people said it. So even if you have self-doubt, you can look at this note where you've collected all of your accomplishments um, and that can really can really help. Um, as I also, um, we talk about imposter syndrome being an internal thing. I think it's also important to note that sometimes it is reinforced by external factors. So just advocate for yourself if you ever do hear um, a biased comment or exclusionary behavior, just make sure that you're um, choosing like organizations and people to surround yourself with that are inclusive and supportive. Um, but yes, I would say your willingness to learn and as a um, a person who recruits and builds teams, what I look for is not a resume full of, you know, experience. Um, I really do look at the individual and it's really important to me to see an optimism um, and a willingness to learn. So, um yeah don't don't even think about the resume too much there are people out there um looking it is important if you know you're going into ux or product design to have a great portfolio um also to pr practice your public speaking mm -hmm. using terms so know all the terminology for the field um and really and, and that'll come with learning and even practice, like practice with friends or family, explain using, you know, industry terminology or even jargon. Um, so that always helps. It helps you look like you know what you're talking about. It helps you look like an expert. Um, and yeah, I think that's that's all of my advice to to everyone. Um, I liked the advice about, you know, you don't, you can't win the lottery if you don't play. So apply for jobs. You never know. Um, sometimes companies, especially in the UX field, want different perspectives. So maybe what you have in your background will resonate for what they are looking for. Um, yeah. What an all-star cast we had. This was all great. And thank each and every one of you. Um, the insights were different. I, They were different, but very valuable nonetheless. Um, and it's interesting, Maribel, hearing you speak. And I think Nat and Anthony could attest to a lot of the things that you're saying are the conversations that we would have in our appointments. I had to track Anthony down the first few times, but once we got on a call, it, it was so his reluctance or the shyness I knew. And then once we got on the call, it, it was a no brainer. So having that support, reaching out to your advisor, reaching out to your family with Maribel mentioning the practice and the saying it. Um, I always tell students, again, talk about it. If you can say it to someone who doesn't know, they can help you identify your knowledge gaps. If you can explain it and they get it, then you actually understand it. So you're working with two different spectrums of people on how you either understand the material that you're currently learning or where you still need to um, sharpen mm -hmm. a few things. I do, um, what do I have, four minutes? So I did have another speaker. He actually had something come up at the last minute. I kind of want to briefly share his story really, really quick. It's just the next slide and, and then we'll get out of here. So I have a family member, Jeffrey Scott. He's actually an IT, he's a senior program manager at Charles Schwab. When I was asking him to speak, he had a wedding that was coming up that he actually couldn't make. It's out of the, the it's in Jamaica, actually. So what I said, hey, Jeff, can you give me some insight to give to some students since you can't actually make it? And here's a little bit about him and what he said. Um, As a 50-year-old man working in IT operations for 90% of my career, the transition I've recently made to cybersecurity product management and data protection 
easily position me to experience imposter syndrome. So we were talking, he said, even at his age, like having an extensive background in IT, but just making the simple switch to a different sector of IT has challenged him in terms of imposter syndrome. He said he had to avoid placing unrealistic expectations on himself. So that's something we try to speak with students about. Let's set some realistic goals for you. Take a little bit at a time. And before you know it, you will be where you want to be. Um, we really are our own worst critics. And he, he wanted me to drive that home. Find an appreciation for the opportunity after being offered the role with limited experience. So if you don't have the experience, still find a way to appreciate how and where you got to. And then recognize the traits most appealing to the, your employer. So that's where your homework comes in on what are what are they looking for? What may be transferable from a previous job that I had that even though I may not have the exact technical experience, I can kind of fill in exactly what they're asking for. So that's a little bit of his story. And then I add, these are the three questions that I asked him. Um, how do you work with employees that you know, maybe experiencing imposter syndrome. Um, he said it is extremely important to note that diagnosing diagnosing someone is never truly in that person's best interest. Ultimately, we never know what's happening behind the scenes or at home with someone's personal life. So label labeling them prematurely can usually cause more harm than good. So just be mindful about what's being said. Uh, it all begins with a conversation whereby the individual is encouraged to share those deep thoughts. Talk. We You keep hearing us harp a lot about speaking. Um, he just said, if you can find someone in your company that you're safe with, communicate, just communicate. Um, and then try to understand where you're at and where your company is. What advice would you give career changers who are battling imposter syndrome? Work on your, in all caps, strengths. So know what you're good at and work on that. Always position yourself to learn something new, but not to the detriment of those capabilities that have gotten you as far as you've gotten in your respective careers. So still be open to learning, but work on your strengths. And then I final question, is there any point of your career where you've experienced imposter syndrome? How did you work through it? I jokingly say that I experienced early onset imposter syndrome, given that within only three months of beginning an entirely new career, I was rather tough on myself. Everyone expected me to know everything within that time frame. Give yourself grace and stay open to learning. So that those were his parting words. Um, special thanks to the panel for coming out making the time to speak with us. We really, really appreciate it. Uh, Patricia did drop the link in the chat. So feel free to give us your thoughts, feedback. What did you enjoy? We'd love to hear it incorporate it into the presentation. Um, but I hope everyone has a great rest of the evening slash afternoon. And thank you all for coming.